Of all conveniences of the 21st century, none are more prevalent and essential to our way of life than electricity and the internet. But imagine, if you will, that one day they just exploded. I mean, literally exploded. All of our power lines, transformers, satellites, and electrical stations gone in a blaze of rampant voltage. The sky from Ontario all the way down to Honolulu glows bright with the northern lights, although the northern part is maybe not as applicable in this situation. The water won't run, your car won't start, and for once in a blue moon, Twitter has gone silent. Not by the hands of any shadowy government operation, rogue terrorist cell, or even human error. No, all of this damage and destruction because the sun passed wind. Solar wind. Let's talk about coronal mass ejections. What is a CME? The sun consists of several zones. The core, where energy is generated from nuclear fusion. The radiative zone, where energy is transferred by radioactive diffusion from the core outwards. The convective zone, a massive ocean of magnetic fields that cause the gas and plasma to circulate like conveyor belts. And the corona, where energy is continuously transformed and expelled as light and heat. When built-up energy distorts the magnetic fields on the sun, an expansive explosion occurs. This explosion of magmatized plasma, electrified gases, subatomic particles, and electromagnetic radiation is a solar flare, also known as a solar storm or solar wind. Solar flares are mostly harmless to us due to Earth's protective atmosphere, which deflects or absorbs the brunt of the storm through the ionosphere. Most often, this produces the phenomenon of the northern lights, aurora borealis, a colorful display in the sky. But solar storms can also have minor impacts on satellites and radio communications. They are a literal storm of magnetic radiation passing through these electronic devices. It's really not good for them. However, in rare occasions when the magnetic fields in the convective zone become excessively distorted, knotted, and tangled, they may unravel as a coronal mass ejection or CME, also called a solar superstorm. A CME is a surge like a solar flare, but many times larger than the Earth, that shoots out from the Sun towards the planet in a matter of hours. When they hit Earth, CMEs can produce geomagnetic storms carrying the energy of roughly 10 billion atomic bombs. The last CME that Earth experienced, and the largest geomagnetic storm humans have on record, was the 1859 Carrington event. This disturbance in the summer of 1859 caused Aurora Borealis to appear as close to the equator as Cuba and Jamaica, turning night into day with bright displays of light. The surge of electromagnetic radiation overwhelmed the atmosphere, causing telegraphs and antiquated mechanical devices worldwide to shoot sparks and malfunction. Beyond that, the Carrington event had little lasting damage and was mostly just a weird sight for 19th century humans. But today, that would be a totally different story. The near-universal reliance on radio communication, electronic devices, satellites, and other modern marvels of the technological revolution places us at an unprecedented risk for the damage of coronal mass ejections. Let's take a look at some possible impacts. As the charged particles of a solar superstorm slam into our atmosphere, they will first begin to affect objects in upper orbit. Satellites are blasted with radiation and particles, inducing malfunction. As these crucial elements of our telecommunications and navigation networks fail, systems on Earth become falling apart, including everything that relied on those telecommunications and navigation networks. International internet, weather, and GPS services are unable to operate, and mobile devices worldwide will lose their signals, which is not good if you couldn't tell. Furthermore, these solar winds can heat the Earth's outer atmosphere, causing it to expand. Changes in atmospheric density affect satellites in orbit, disrupting their paths to the point where they may begin falling from the sky and burning up in re-entry if they are not relocated. This is bad enough for unmanned communication satellites, but for satellites like the International Space Station and even some high-flying airplanes, it is significantly more dangerous. To a satellite, an unstable atmosphere not only presents the possibility of flight failure, but it also removes layers of major protection against a bath of radiation and high-speed particles. Very high-energy particles, such as those carried by CMEs, can cause radiation poisoning to humans and other mammals. They would be dangerous to unshielded astronauts in orbit, and large doses could be fatal. Long story short, space is not a good place to be inside of a storm. Not that things are going that well on the ground, either. 
Good news, the atmosphere would still protect us from most of that harmful radiation. Some old, young, or sickly people might be at higher risk of radiation poisoning, but most people should be fine. Bad news, nothing works. High electric currents in the magnetosphere induce electric fluctuations at ground level, causing buildup of charge and eventual overloading of all components of the electrical grid. Transformers and power stations blow out en masse, causing widespread blackouts and total loss of power. Ordinary solar flares are known to black out entire cities, even entire regions, so the amount of damage from a CME would be magnitudes greater. Even after the initial blast, the magnetic fields still linger in Earth's atmosphere, and so electronic devices and even simple conductive metals will retain that charge until it is grounded and dissipated. This means that repair crews are likely unable to begin repairs for days or weeks, and rolling blackouts may be present for months, with years until the power grid fully recovers. So, how likely are we to encounter a coronal mass ejection? About once a week. Alright, so that's a bit misleading. CMEs happen on a bit of a scale. Depending on how active the sun is, coronal mass is ejected anywhere between once every five days at the minimum level of activity to three times a day at the maximum levels. However, these are normally smaller ejections, more on the scale of a solar flare, and they either don't hit the Earth or aren't that influential. For example, on August 20th, 2018, a mid-sized and unusually slow CME had formed and then later hit the Earth on about August 26th, with auroras visible as far south as Montana and Wisconsin. Very little, if any, damage actually occurred. However, compare that to a more serious CME, like the solar storm of July 23rd, 2012, the last major CME to nearly hit the Earth. Missing the planet by about nine days' time, it would have been the worst solar storm in roughly 150 years, and is estimated to have been nearly as strong as, or even stronger than, the Carrington event. So, more or less, it would have been the worst case scenario. The fact that it did miss us is pure luck. Scientists estimate that the likelihood of a CME of that size colliding with the Earth in the next 10 years is somewhere around 12%. So far, we've had a streak of good luck to be able to develop our technology with little interference from solar storms, but that may change very quickly, so it's best to be prepared. So how do we, as residents of the Earth, prepare for getting smacked by the sun with some electric stardust? Well, first and foremost, our infrastructure needs to be sunproofed, designed to be able to handle the surges when they happen. To start, Humans can work to establish early detection systems around the sun, like a network of warning satellites, so we can monitor for signs of dangerous activity. Part of the issue in preparing for incoming CMEs is that we can't see what the entirety of the sun is doing at a given moment. As it sits, we can really only see half the sun half the time. The European Space Agency, or ESA, a less cool version of NASA, has been planning to launch satellites as part of its Lagrange series of missions, which would orbit around the sun and monitor for the positions that we can't see. These extra eyes in the sky could drastically improve our warning time, which right now sits at about 6 to 12 hours. Extra warning time would allow satellites to enter safe modes, taking cover behind the planet or in higher orbit, and would let astronauts know when to not plan any spacewalks. On planet side, it would also let the electrical engineers, technicians, and operators of the electric grid know when there is an incoming CME. With enough warning time, these professionals can temporarily shut down the power grid, inducing an artificial blackout. As the CME hits, instead of overwhelming and eventually breaking a bunch of running electronics, the charge passes through the system and can be much more quickly dissipated. Switching off the grids would mean that we avoid the majority of damages that we could otherwise expect from a solar superstorm, saving years of rebuilding efforts. Alternatively, we could take advantage of this incoming surge of energy and go one step further. Rather than shutting down the entire grid, crucial elements like hospitals and government buildings would be disconnected, leaving a specialized system in place that would absorb the incoming energy. This could be redirected to generators designed to handle the excess flow of electricity, storing it for later use once the storm has passed. But whatever the case, and whatever solutions we do decide to come up with for this problem, we need to have the proper infrastructure in place. 
nothing we have installed at the moment in any place on the planet could withstand a major CME. So the heads of our utilities need to act fast, and by extension, our governments need to act fast. Given their track record, that's not the best thing to be hoping for. However, there is some hope. Back in 2015, the United States government unveiled documents with plans to mitigate the effects of a CME on the American public. There were six major points that they were focusing on in response to these possible threats. 1. Establish benchmarks showing how commonly severe space weather events occur. 2. Improve the ability to respond to and recover from such events. 3. Reduce or eliminate vulnerabilities to flares and geomagnetic storms. 4. Improve predictions about impacts on critical infrastructure. 5. Improve forecasts of space weather events and knowledge of space weather more generally. And 6. Increase international cooperation on the front of CMEs. While we all know the snail's pace and half-throttle at which our government operates, expressing our concern on the matter and raising awareness to both public representatives and the private sector will be our best shot at ushering in any change before it may be too late. And hey, regardless of what the government says or does, nothing's stopping you from making your own home CME-proof. It's more or less just one big EMP. Same concept applies. Wrap your home and all of your electronics in lead or something like that. Even if the rest of society has lost power, at least your stuff will still work. Until you run out of power too, that's still gonna be an issue. Coronal mass ejections pose a pretty serious threat to our digitally reliant society. The idea of all of our modern luxuries and infrastructure systems disappearing with very little warning should be enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. But we're in luck. We are currently capable of using that technology we're so scared of losing to prepare our power grid for solar storms. With enough planning and foresight to prevent and mitigate damages, coronal mass ejections may one day mean nothing more than dinner and a light show.